Good afternoon, my name is Bill Shea. I'm one of the clinicals for Syncardia. I cover the Eastern region. Um, the next half an hour will be um, a conversation about how to identify where the Syncardia TAH would be best used for your program. Well, we're probably gonna be working on a series of these. Today in particular, we're generally just looking at how we identify how you at your center best identifies a patient with biventricular failure. Um, I'll kind of cover a couple things about the TAH as well as some literature that's out there about right ventricular failure or biventricular failure. And then we'll, um, you know, the, there are pointed questions, kind of like a Socratic inquiry, like how do you use your devices? Where do you use do your devices? Do you have algorithms such like that, protocols, guidelines? So, the next one. so generally speaking, you know, at your center, when you have a patient that comes in with acute decompensation heart failure, how do you, how does your team come together? Do you have a committee? Do you have um, a patient that comes in from an outside hospital? How do you come to a decision on what choices for devices, short term to long term? Um, and access to advanced heart failure therapies. I pulled this from the Journal of Canadian Cardiology um, in 2017. It's just an example of a short-term algorithm and how this, a couple centers in Montreal and Quebec, use short-term devices to support patients. It's not a recommendation by any stretch of the imagination, but in terms of teams, you know, the, the cardiac team is the buzzword these days, you know, the heart team. So how do you use, where do you use, and for what indication do you use your um, devices? So how does the TAH fit into your program? I saw this the other day and I thought it was kind of perfect. Like, so there are some centers that have a lot of volume of TAH, Shown by the, um, shown by this up here, like the TH is acceptable for any patient, and then having to follow the maze for cheese, and sometimes what we end up with is the last resort. So, like, where do you find yourself on the spectrum for the use of your devices, including the TH, when you use them? So, I just kind of put up here some general indications of where we might see the TAH used. On the left-hand column, it's more of a medical pathway, and then the right-hand column it tends to be more of a surgical pathway. So like what kind of patients present? You know, I just recently supported a patient in Montreal that was a 48-year-old um, with a long um, family history of cardiovascular disease um, with a short lifetime for those events. Um, big MI blew out a septum and his uh, had an aneurysmal left ventricular apex, um, ended up getting a TAH immediately upon transfer to the Montreal Hospital and was transplanted within a week. So, you know, generally speaking, like where we'll see a lot is, of course, cardiogenic shock, very popular is our malignant arrhythmias. Things that are developing um, for us at uh, Syncardia is our congenital platform for the adults now that are reaching um, the end of life for their procedures. You know, are they transplantable and what kind of anatomy will they need for transplant? Another popular indication is restrictive um, physiologies, something where the myocardium becomes so hypertrophed and fibrosed. Um, and then obviously these are typical other uh, indications here on the right hand side with, um, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, surgical indications. When we look, so going from the indications or possible etiologies for our advanced heart failure patients for the use of the TAH and other devices, what are some of the risks for the TAH? I mean, we talk about this all the time with patient timing and selection, right? Like, when they're already on dialysis, like how bad is their heart failure, their acute heart failure that they're now on dialysis or they're now on some short-term MCS like ECMO. 
um, where their liver is in shock as well. I mean, these are not new to us in terms of the MCS spectrum, but you know, the higher the the lower the albumin and the higher the bilirubin, they tend to not do as well, depending on whatever device you use. So is the TAH the best option? And when is it good to use the TAH? You know, I don't know how you review your patient selection and for devices. You know, you rescue them, you try to stabilize them, you try to reverse some of the end organ dysfunction, right? So patients on ECMO, how long have they been on ECMO? What are their hemodynamics? You know, right heart cath, echo, other kinds of imaging that you might want to use. Um, you know, we have one popular surgeon that likes to actually consent for all possible devices and then open the chest and evaluate the right ventricle just as he opens the chest. Um, interesting consenting process. I just brought this paper in just for um, an idea. Since no one seems to have a general consensus of what white ventricular failure looks like, we took the Intermax report from 2018 of all the TAH implants that were taken to date at the time and what the baseline characteristics and patient characteristics look like. In terms of describing right heart failure, obviously they were already on dialysis. They were already being supported or dependent upon the ventilator. They were on some sort of other temporary MCS and that they had severe um, structural disease as well. Interestingly enough to notice that the LDH, uh, uh, an enzyme for liver function and perfusion, typically under 250, the mean was two to three times that of the upper limit normals. You can see here 80% of the patients were an intramax patient profile of one to two, 75% of them were on inotropes, and at least 50% of them had the diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy. If any of you have any questions about that, I do have more information on that paper. But but we have tried, right? Like if I was a center that's taking care of these patients with temporary devices, like I have tried to evaluate or I have done everything I can to optimize uh, forward flow, either with temporary devices or other medications. You know, how can it be used? Obviously we just briefly covered the indications in the disease processes to identify biventricular failure, but how do you as your center predict right heart failure or identify it? You know, I just listed a couple things here, but you know, typically renal and hepatic function is obviously a long, long-term impact of acute right heart failure. Do, I don't know, do any of your centers, do you at your center use a right heart failure risk score? And then in some cases, we have some patients that, uh, excuse me, they have some centers, some surgeons and cardiologists that use a temporary short-term device for the left side to identify um, if the right side can handle a device. So I have been someone in my career as a VAD and ECMO coordinator where we've put an impella or a balloon pump or Centromag or some kind of short-term device to see quite um, how the right side does when we unload the left side. Sometimes it goes well, most of the time it does, and then there are times when it doesn't. You know, which are, are those the patients that we want to use? You know, this is what I mean about the inquiry. Like, are, is this the patient that we're talking about that um, would benefit from a TAH? Um, and I think Joe had pointed out to me a patient where um, if, you have v, if you have VV ECMO or even um, an, an axillary impella placement where you're ambulating the patient and they're still requiring moderate to multiple inotropes to support the patient while they're on a temporary device while ambulating, um, that that would be a indi potential indication for that their right ventricle may need further support. Pardon? Um, and then like, what do we do when we transition from short-term devices to long-term devices? You know, like, you know, obviously acute cardiogenic shock are patients that show up. Um, peripheral ECMO in the field, use of Centromag, um, uh, getting us um, cardio help, five ads, Centromags. Is there anybody in, in your institutions that are using durable bivads? 
like heart bear or even heart mate three, you know, and at what time do you transition these patients to those devices from short term to long term? You know, what is your end organ perfusion marker for moving towards surgery? You know, nutrition, um, liver, kidney, right? How are they able to participate in terms of their neurological function? And then I pose this question here when we're uh, identifying biventricular failure. Um, and in particular, when going through the literature, depending on the kind of center, you know, multi-center experience, when we, I, I read this paper, anywhere from 8 to 40% of all patients that got durable devices experienced some sort of right ventricular failure after a durable LVAD. And they had multiple different strategies and varying levels of results from survival post implant to transplant and transplant survival, usually between the uh, 40 to 60% range. Joe, do you want me to share my screen with you or do you want me to be your slide advancer? Uh, you can, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll share my screen. Okay. Or you can share it. Yeah, I'm going to stop. There you go. It's all yours. Perfect. Sorry, I was ahead a couple slides. Yeah. So for BTT patients and transplant allocation rules, you know, how, how should we change our ways of thinking? You know, and, and at our biventricular summit in the fall, you know, the, the, with the new UNOS allocation changes, um, you know, the big discussion is, is, you know, we can get a heart in a week, we can get in a heart in two weeks, or we can get a heart in a couple of days. Every center is a little different. And, the, 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 you know, the discussion around the entire audience was that we can get our patients transplanted pretty quick if we put them on some type of short-term MCS. Um, and, you know, and the preliminary data that came out said that some of the strategies that are being used to transplant these patients quickly off short-term MCS, as well as, uh, you know, you know and ECMO falls into that, um, into that group. The outcomes aren't spectacular, but uh, so the the one pediatric physician we had at the at the meeting said, you know, that the the goal isn't to isn't how quick we can transplant these patients. The goal, you know, is survivability at a year and five years out. Um, you know, and that was one of the big topics for discussion during the meetings. Like, hey, I think we're missing we're missing the ball a little bit on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, so, you know, and, and as the, the last bullet on the bottom is the TH, you know, is the only device since the new uh, UNOS changes is that is permanent status too, whether they're in the hospital or they're discharged to home, um, which is a big component because we used to drop down a status um, when we, uh, with the previous allocation. So, uh, so we're going to go through some case reports. Uh, if anyone has um, has questions about that, uh, um, we can um, bring them up in the chat function. Or if you'd like to talk, uh, we don't have a super large group, um, so we could um, uh, we could bring up questions. You can feel free to ask. So uh, the first case report um, is, you know, previously healthy ten year old. Uh, sudden cardiac arrest in VF, initially responded to uh, DFib and medication, uh, DCM, large apical aneurysm, depressed LV. Uh, during his stay at frequent uh, ventricular ectopy VT, which severely impacted his hemodynamics, uh, he was optimized uh, briefly by medical treatment, which resulted in hemodynamic bradycardia and unstable uh, ventricular dysrhythmias. Uh, due to his fragile clinical status, it was decided to use MCS. 
Um, he left ventricular septum aneurysm, prohibited the team from using an LVAD. Um, the TH was chosen due to persistent ventricular arrhythmias. Um, after implant of TH, the patient recovered, was mobilized, and switched to portable freedom driver on, on day 21. Uh, he remained on support for 69 days uh, prior to transplant. So um, it was a great, great story. Um, you know, and this, uh, this was a case report uh, from Phoenix Children's. Uh, successful implantation of TH in pediatric patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. Uh, so, uh, you know, in, in conclusion with this, uh, the TH is a viable option as BTT in appropriately selected pediatric cases. Uh, now that the 50 cc is approved, uh, it's a great option to extend support to younger and smaller patients. Um, TH implantation may allow for decreased sedation and ventilation and increased mobilization prior to transplant. So one of the big goals that we try for uh, with these patients is to get them um, ambulatory as quick as possible. Uh, case report number two. Uh, this is an interesting case. 70-year-old uh, female, cardiogenic shock uh, with multiple arrests for malignant VT. History of Lynch syndrome, uh, thyroid cancer, total thyroidectomy in 1989, uh, breast cancer, lumpectomy in 2000, hypertension, uh, HLD, hyperthyroid, proximal AF, uh, class 3 CHF, elevated troponins, uh, creatinine is 1.5, uh, BMP of 3000, EF of 20, 25%. And the CT showed thickening of uh, sigmoid colon, family history of colon cancer. Uh, so emergent evaluation and therapy, balloon pump place, milrinone and epi, uh, left heart cath, no coronary artery disease. Uh, deemed not a transplant candidate at the time. Um, some uh, question of malignancy and uh, with the patient's age. So, uh, you know, different centers have different cutoffs and we've seen cutoffs uh, anywhere from 60 to 70 um, with the TH. Uh, VCU is our most uh, active user in the U.S. as a single center um, and their cutoff for TH was 60 years old or is 60 years old and their bridge rate is 82 percent and it's their survivability post-transplant at a year is is 80 to 83 percent. So they uh, their cutoff is 60, uh, and reason being is um, they they found that uh, the older patients have a difficult time of um, sur you know surviving the multiple surgeries. Uh, that was their argument in in going from 65 back to 60 with the TH. Um, this patient again was 70, uh, got transplanted, uh, things went well, you know, again, uh, we've talked with different centers that do different things with, uh, timing and limitations. So what would you do, uh, you know, with this patient, send them to palliative care, uh, plan a durable VAD and ablation in the OR, a uh, place on transplant list as an exception to our protocol or implant TH as a DT trial. So um, again, this patient um, was looking for options. So uh, they decided to go TH uh, and the patient went from a DT status to transplant. So it was a great success story. Some unique and differentiating features of the TH, um, single integrated device for bi -V failure, uh, it's the only labeled device uh, that's approved for biventricular support. Uh, unique blood handling, uh, no bearings in the circuit. And um, we, uh, with the TAH, uh, you have the ability to run these patients with near normal physiology, nor uh, low CVP, pulsatile flow. Uh, it's less preload sensitive. Um, Utilize when short-term device with medical care is not trending in the right direction after week one in the ICU. 
And then as you can see, the scales are tipping in the wrong direction, medically and economically for the team. Um, so TH etiologies, uh, this is from Intermax publication. Um, you know, in the lion's share of the patients uh, in this publication were dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, then when, once you drift down, it goes to restrictives um, and then ischemics. TH applications, Bill touched on this briefly um, at the beginning, but most common pre-implant etiologies, uh, idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, ischemic, congenital and genetic, uh, post-heart transplant graft failure, uh, valvular cardiomyopathy, restrictive cardiomyopathy, and then LVAD failures, uh, device malfunction with RV failure as well. Uh, conditions considered for TH, again, irreversible by V failure. RVEF is less than 20%. CVP is greater than 18. Uh, graft failure, rejection or heart transplant vasculopathy. Decompensated right heart failure on LVAD support. Uh, failure to wean from ECMO. Massive uh, MI or direct myocardial injury that affects technical insertion of a VAD. Recurrent VTVF, uh, intractable thrombus, or I'm sorry, intracardiac thrombus. Uh, small non-dilated ventricles, hypertrophs, infiltrative, um, and other restrictive cardiomyopathies. Uh, Post-infarct BSD or type A aortic dissection uh, with coronary artery dissection. Uh, End-stage congenitals, um, aortic regurg, stenosis, prosthesis, or other valve issues with bi-V failure, uh, and cardiac tumors. Um, so uh, looking over to the right, uh, and we'll drift into this into the next slide. Um, you know, the TH should be considered, um, you know, for the etiolo these etiologies. So with that being said, um, uh, we've developed uh, five clinical algorithms. Um, as, as a guide, you know, when you're considering TH uh, for these patients, uh, it's a nice topic for discussion. Uh, when you have a TH program uh, to consider these etiologies because um, we have uh, fairly good outcomes with this, uh, with these. Um, so just working our way, we have one for um, malignant VTVF. Uh, we have one for graft failure. We have for, for uh, cardiogenic shock, uh, restrictive cardiomyopathies, and acute MIs with uh, VSD. So um, this, these are all uh, publication reviewed. I'll show you in the next slide. So this, um, this is something that Syncardia had put together um, with, uh, with publication backup. And, so and just walk in our way. What's that? As well as our um, medical advisory board, both our surgical and um, medical advisory board. We have an international and national advisory board with most of our implanting sites that do a certain volume. So just wanted to point out that this is something that we didn't make up. This is something that our medical advisory board, along with other standards of care when it came to advanced heart failure, getting patients to transplant in terms of medical and short-term devices. This was something that our MAB had um, essentially put together for us. So working our way through uh, the VTVF algorithm, uh, you know, the typical path is uh, medication, uh, ablation one, two, three. Along that path might be a dual chamber or by VICD. Um, you know, and if the patient um, is a candidate, they may get listed for transplant. Um, and then the consideration typically is LVAD. Uh, with that being said, uh, the patient can still have VT uh, with an LVAD and still get shocked. Um, with TH, uh, we can remove um, uh, the, the ventricles and um, stop the uh, defibrillation, you know, prior to uh, the patient ending up with, um, uh, with shock syndrome. So, so medical severity increasing and or, or ablation un unsuccessful. So we talked about that. But if it is successful, you know, then the patient's stabilized. Um, so um, if you, we keep going down this path, and some of these patients 
um, that our ischemic cardiomyopathy VT ablations are very difficult in. Um, and there's multiple uh, different sources of where the VT is originating from. So uh, if we go straight down the uh, flow algorithm, uh, clinical de presentation day four on temporary MCS, uh, unable to decrease creatinine and bilirubin, increasing lactate. So again, these patients are having these bouts of VT along the way. Um, you know, and so if we go that route, um, or if you see we go to the right, uh, we go to implant uh, TH after um, ablation one or two is tried. Uh, again, the patient will probably have an ICD, but you know, if, we're, if it's incurable, um, then the patient um, will continue to have VT. Uh, we have, you know, I've, I've worked with teams and I've been on a team in the past over the years where we've left patients in VT and VF. Um, prior to transplant for a week or so. Um, so, uh, but going to TH again, we'd stop the vasopressors and inotropes, manage uh, the driver with golds, uh, lower the CVP, uh, manage fluid volume and creatinine with ultrafiltration and our diuretics. Uh, we could avoid blood products and uh, sensitization. And again, one of the things we discussed earlier is mobilizing these patients. Um, as soon as possible to get these patients in better shape for transplant. Um, you know, we, these patients, again, if we do, we are able to discharge them home prior to transplant, they stay a status too. So even if we had them out of the hospital for 24 hours and an organ becomes available, um, these patients will stay a status too. So uh, on the back side of the, uh, the VTVF algorithm, uh, the goal is to maximize uh, survival post-heart transplant, plan to transfer patient if unable to see improvement within 24 hours. Um, so, you know, if the patient, if, if the patient is not currently at a heart transplant center, uh, timely consultation with the center to understand and current donor availability. Um, so, you know, there, we go down these steps to help uh, teams build up their TH program. Uh, one of the things in discussing uh, different etiologies and algorithms, we spoke with the team or I spoke with the team at VCU and Dr. Shaw had discussed uh, the fact that um, as a team, uh, when they became serious with their TH program, um, they had to, you know, look at different outcomes um, as opposed to using a BIVAD or using a TH or using an LVAD and temporary um, RV support. And, you know, they agreed on three or four etiologies. And one of the ones that they discussed was restrictive cardiomyopathy. And when they went to TH early with restrictives, um, they have a 15 to 20% better survivability than they do going with LVAD, BIVAD, or LVAD and temporary RVAD. So, uh, this is a topic for discussion and say, oh, well, maybe we could use it for this or that, or maybe we missed a patient along the way. So again, I, I discussed these briefly. Uh, so these are the uh, five algorithms that we have. Uh, refractory VTVF we discussed. Uh, cardiogenic shock, as Bill discussed, uh, when these patients um, are on ECMO, you know, it, if we can make a decision earlier on whether they're a transplant candidate or not, um, it's a great idea to have an exit strategy um, because ECMO is not your exit strategy. Um, again, le in leaving your patient on ECMO for an extended period of time um, prior to transplant, um, your, the outcome data uh, isn't in support of that. Um, MI with VSD, we talked about that. Again, uh, the repair issue is, is one of the big, big things when you have wide open VSDs associated with MIs. Uh, we, we talked about restrictives briefly um, and failed graph. The nice thing about using TH for uh, graph rejection is we can put the patient on the device, take them off all immunosuppression while we recover them and wait to relist them. So in conclusion, 
Uh, the TH cohort is not an LVAD cohort. Um, it's a different implant strategy. It's a different thought process. Structural issues, uh, different in BIVAD versus TAH. Uh, consider TH for Intermax patients uh, one through four. Uh, and then, you know, things we've discussed along the way with the dilators and the ischemics and the other multiple operations is consider the structural issues and indications and risk for deaths, uh, risk for death, sorry. And then uh, consider risk factors that were discussed. Um, so that being said, does, does anybody have uh, questions? I'll stop sharing. So Bill's up uh, now. So in the chat, Yeah, I, I posted a, just a question. So uh, if you have any questions, we, we, we are recording this. So um, your uh, contribution can be shared with others. Um, I guess the, you know, the thing I really wanted to make sure you guys have an opportunity to discuss is how do you evaluate it? It's not just us as a company telling you something. We're not here to be prescriptive with you. So it's like, how do you evaluate it? Because your pathways to success are just as important as someone else's, even though we discussed BCU at length today. So Dr. Silverman, uh, Rich, uh, I know uh, Eddie's on the phone. Uh, any, anything that uh, you have questions or anything? I can, I can just give me my two cents. <clears throat> you covered all the all the areas. Um, the one thing that I was going to add is is when we are evaluating patients for transplant, um, we leave open all the devices. But one of the things we do that wasn't talked about is we will make sure the device fits. So we are trying to get a T10 on patients that even if they're in a gray area that could put, potentially have a TH, we get that early. Because a lot of times the things you're talking about happen quickly, and and if if you literally are talking about TH, you should be moving in that direction as fast as possible because it, it just takes time. Uh, there's just a lot of pieces that sometimes have to come together, especially since most of the centers aren't, you know, volume centers or don't do it that often. Um, so getting the company involved as early as possible, even if it's just uh, for how do we do this as a hypothetical? You know, do we have the equipment? Do we have the devices on the shelf? Uh, all those things need to be taken into consideration early. I'll stop there. Steve, did you want to add on uh, the topic for two weeks? Uh, to the groups and the people that are on. Well, one of the one of the great things we we've got uh, one of the things that we're doing with these uh, Syncardia office hours is recording it because we've had a lot of people uh, express interest in being able to to uh, access these uh, videos or these recordings later. So we do record this and we can send out uh, the, the links to this video later. Now in two weeks, we actually have a guest lecturer coming and uh, actually he's worth, here with us right now, Rich. He's going to be uh, addressing in two weeks, he's going to be talking uh, about op optimization of the driving system, early post-operative management, and assessing when it's time to switch from the hospital-based driver to the freedom driver. And uh, uh, he's gonna address that plus uh, other topics that he, feel, he feels like would fit into that uh, category. And then in, uh, at the end of this month, we actually have Dr. Kier Shah from VCU who's going to be discussing uh, to uh, provide to providers uh, a little bit about his experience and uh, and others. So, uh, anything else that you have to add to that, Joe, Bill? 
uh, you know, it, it, we're building it out right now. And uh, the discussion is going to be uh, the utilization and TH and uh, the restrictive population. Yeah, that will be the last uh, Friday of this month. So that's uh, in four weeks from today. But uh, and not only that, but like, what, what, what do you want to see? Like, so here we are talking about these different things, but you as our customers and our guests, you know, what are the questions, concerns, considerations you have um, that we can bring to you? from not just ourselves as a company, but the experts in the field that are using the technology. Gentlemen, I'm not sure I'm the audience for you for most of this. I'm a cardiovascular intensivist. So um, I would just wanted to, we've only used your device once. Um, I, our, my experience is obviously minuscule I was just listening in to see what, what you guys had to say. I'd be happy to listen to the lecture that uh, the doctor is gonna present in two weeks. Uh, always happy to hear more information about things I don't know, uh, but I have really very little to contribute to this conversation, I'm sorry. Uh, I, well, I, you know, I believe, you know, Dr. Silverman, you know, that the, the cardiac intensivists are really um, a big component of the management part of this. Um, which is, you know, and Rich and Steve and Bill uh, can all attest to, which is one of the biggest components outside of selecting these patients is the proper management of it. So, I, I, you know, you do bring a ton to the conversation, sir. So um, I appreciate you jumping on with us. Thank you for having me. Um, I look forward to hearing the, the next lecture. Whenever it comes up, send me an email. I'll be happy to jump in and listen to that too. Will do, sir. Thank you, gentlemen. Have a wonderful day. Stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks everyone for jumping on. Um, like we mentioned, this uh, is uh, the slide sets recorded. So uh, we'll, we'll circle back with you with access to uh, review at a later time. Thanks, it was, it, it was good. Thank Good you. Morning. See you later. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.